All right, and here we are. Uh, we are gonna be starting our next interview. We're gonna be talking with this very special guest because this week is a big, we're talking uh, Star Trek Three, The Search for Spock, uh, which was the third of the Star Trek films to come out uh, in 1984. It was released June. Uh, and we're here talking with one of the stars of that film. We have the lovely Robin Curtis who joining us. Thank you so much for coming. Hi, Kyle. Hi, Don. Hi, listeners. Happy to be here. <laughs> awesome. So, much. so glad to have you here. Um, so we, you know, we, we've known this film for a long time. We watched it as kids. And I mean, so many people grew up with that. How, how has that kind of impacted you uh, in your life? You know, just that, oh. that moment. Oh my goodness. I, it's, it's, it's beyond capturing in words. I mean, Star Trek, Star Trek, uh, very, very, you know, in the moment at the time that it happened, had a huge impact on my life because my dad had been diagnosed with cancer earlier that summer. And in August I tested and was cast. And so while my family went through this just really heartbreaking experience, um, we had Star Trek to, to just buoy us along and kind of distract us from our misery and our grief. And, 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 you know, and, 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 and what a, what a crazy thing, you know, to, to have be that, be that beacon, you know, but, but your daughter gets cast in a major motion picture. Do you know what I mean? Like, like I, I yeah. couldn't, I couldn't, it was the perfect uh, novelty in our lives uh, to, to be unfolding as right. we dealt with this, you know, this crisis in the family and he lived long enough to see the movie. Awesome. And that was especially d delightful because my parents were, were sort of the, the uh, antithesis of most moms and dads whose kids want to be in a creative field. You know, they weren't constantly asking me when I was, when was I going to get a real job? You know, <laughs> it, it, it was, it was, Hey honey, how you doing? What can we give you? What can we send you? We love you. We're rooting for you. So I had, I had just, you know, unconditional support mm. throughout it, my, the beginnings of my, of my creative career. And you need that, you know, yeah. it, even if I didn't need their money, uh, necessarily, or or for them to buy me a car to drive to California when I moved from New York to California, mm -hmm. the, the moral support meant more than anything. Mm -hmm. And so this this was a sweet little little uh, the, the the movie was just a, a a breathtaking way to let my father know I, I might actually be okay in this crazy business. <laughs> now now all the decades since it has come to mean epic friendship, um, uh, world travel. Uh, uh, adventures I couldn't have imagined, um, being associated with a class act, because uh, I, I happen personally to think that Gene Roddenberry was a class act, uh, and, and what he stood for resonates with me uh, on so many levels. So so the, the original experience or the initial experience and all that's happened since has sort of overshadowed that. Do you know what I mean? The right. playing part is is one thing, uh, and 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 the wonderful uh, 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 joy that this was for my family at the time. Mm -hmm. But really, it's been such a personal, a personal journey um, with the franchise, with the fandom, with the friendship, the travel, and and obviously, you know, it's been a boon financially. Do, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? It's been it's yeah. been a sweet sweet little nugget every now and then you know thank you star trek thank you gene roddenberry you know comes my way and i'm so, grateful to my toes were, were you a fan of star trek as a kid when it was on originally well i i i'm not i'm never quite sure how to categorize <laughs> this because you know because my older brother was a fan and mm -hmm. he actually he understood the show like he understood you know gene's forward thinking and, 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 you know, uncanny predictions of what, of what medical diagnosis would look like and beaming, you know, and, and the doors, whatever he, he just, he just, under, my older brother understood all those things and, and the moral lessons that were, that were happening. And for me, it was, it was, <laughs> it was the, lo the love stories every week, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, Star Trek for me was like a living, young romance comic or something 
Mm -hmm. you, you know, because it was always Kirk or Shatner, usually the two of them, or, I mean, not Kirk or Shatner, but Kirk or, or, or um, uh, Spock, mm -hmm. uh, having some sort of, you know, titillating, uh, provocative <laughs> connection to, to an, a woman or an alien or something. Right. And that, that resonated with me a lot. Cause I guess I was, I don't know, I was 10. So, <laughs> so I had all of these, you know, prepubescent hormones, you know, raging through me. And, um, and so I, that, that was my impression of Star Trek, that it was erotic, <laughs> kinky, kinky, kinky in its way. <laughs> yeah. It's an interesting way to look at it. The first interracial kiss happened right. Right. because of a kinky alien. Yeah. Let's face it. Big moment. Yeah. And now, so here it is years later, the show ended in what, 69. And here it is 15 years later when, when three comes out. But at that point, did, you know, when you became involved with the picture, you got cast, you were, you were going to play the part of Savic was, did you, did you anticipate that? Oh my God, I'm going to be a part of this legacy that's going to last for decades beyond that. I, I so I knew I was a part of something that was big and, and that pre preceded me and already had a gravitas, you know, but I mm -hmm. didn't, I did not understand the longevity for decades to come that mm -hmm. that was lost upon me completely and and i and i regret you know walter koenig tried to clue me in he said keep a diary you know literally keep a diary of every day on the job your thoughts your feelings your experiences and i didn't i didn't i was way too consumed with just trying to get the the part right sure. excuse me um um but he, but because he knew, he knew there was going to be an experience beyond this, well beyond this, and you'll want to remember every little detail, <laughs> you know. And uh, so he was right, and and no, I didn't, I didn't realize yeah. it would be a part of my life forever. When when did you realize? Like so, so here it is. After the movie's been out for a long time, like at what point did you finally say, "Oh my God, people want." to talk to me about this movie and, and yeah like, I think it took about a year hmm. because because I would go to a convention and I was still was not convinced that that I brought anything to the table like I didn't understand my value to the people I was joining hmm. um it, it, I really just didn't feel worthy of of the invitation and of the experience at, but but slowly but surely the people who you know who who greeted me and and invited me and and back in the day those were fan run conventions which were so sweet and so mm -hmm. intimate and and really had a lot of soul you know right. um, you know they they their their you know affection convinced me you we want you here we want to hear your, your stories it doesn't matter how entertaining you think they are <laughs> <laughs> you know we want to know we're genuinely interested mm -hmm. and and that and that was lovely you know to to give over to that to sort of let go of any self-consciousness I had or or insecurity and just you know dive in and and I've been diving in now for what almost almost 40 years it's mm -hmm. been 38 yeah oh my yeah it has yeah it's creeping up on the yeah, that's I mean it's incredible that I mean you think about it that a lot of you know actors and actresses are in all these films and they might get accolades or they might run into a fan on the street but there's these dedicated conventions where people can actually just kind of share that love and that commonality and the stories and kind of validate the importance of what you were able to to do and it's kind of kind of a neat thing I mean I think at first I think Kyle and I can both admit our very first Star Trek convention was, and we're fans. I yes. mean, we're, we're the geeks, we're the nerds. We yep. would have dressed up. We kind of walked in and we were kind of taken aback. We're like, whoa, this is a little little over the top. It was overwhelming. Yeah. Right. But once we realized that we all had a story, we all had favorite characters, we all had something that kind of gave us that commonality of we love this, this mission, this story and what's going on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and then Tom fell in love with the characters, but then had those opportunities to, you know, kind of really get to know um, the actors and actresses. And I mean, I, you're just, you're one of them, which was really great that, you know, I think, you know, 
we always envision people of, you know, meeting them someday. And uh, you, you were exactly who we thought we wanted you to be when we met you in, oh, in person yes. for the first time. It, yeah, and yeah. it was it was unexpected right. when we met. Oh, you. thank you. Once that again, means a lot to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, co the commonality of living here in Waterville, not too far from Utica, New York Hills, <laughs> in the area. So mm -hmm. we're like, hey, she's one of us. We this is even better. And then to find out, wait, she went to Oswego. I went to Oswego. And then all of a sudden it was like, you know, yes, yeah, somebody from a small town can go and do some really great things mm -hmm. that we can oh. be proud of, that we can support um, and and just kind of follow you along in, in that journey, which has been really, really cool. Absolutely. So, thank you. Thank you. I, 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 even in L.A., I was a small town girl. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I made my world small to, to, just to make life there manageable. You know, I, I went to the same gas station. I went to the same grocer, um, you know, dry cleaner, whatever it may have been to, to just to just kind of replicate the Waterville, yeah. the New York Mills, you yeah. know, the Oswego that, that, that was what yeah. I was familiar with, you know, yeah. so I, I, I've, I've lived in uh, bigger cities and I've done that same thing. I always yes. get a very, I, I go to specific places that make me comfortable. <laughs> Yes, yes, it, 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 it yeah, it, it's, it soothes your soul. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, you know, we're creatures of, I guess, habit and comfort sure. and, and small is comforting to me. Absolutely. So yeah. let, let's backpedal uh, to, to okay. the start of your career uh, oh, a little before. So what, where did you sort of, so now you're inspired, you want to become an actor. What, where did that kind of uh, originate? Where were you at at that point well, in your life? So here's the thing. I, I, I didn't want to be an actor. Hmm. Uh, I really didn't. I, I, I mean, no more than I thought I wanted to be a field hockey player. Uh, <laughs> uh, and what I mean by that is that, is that I, I was just a really active kid in, in high school. And, and once you go to college, because I grew up in a small town, right, I could be active right. in everything. I literally would go to the game, the football game in my cheerleading uniform, and then change immediately during halftime to put the marching band uniform on. And, and I played the <laughs> pocket spiel going through the, the field. And then, and then I hustled back to the you know, locker to, to, get, to get my cheerleading uniform back on. Um, and I was in the school plays and I would come right on the bus, you know, back from a field hockey game and go right in for rehearsal. And my mother would bring me a tuna sandwich to the school. Um, so, no, my point is I got to college and you had to pick. You couldn't be in sports and music. So I picked music mm. and, and, and I picked a communications major and a theater minor. And, and so I was in some productions and I hung out with the kids, you know, the creative kids. And really it was music that mm -hmm. I loved through, through college guys and then when I was you know I had my degree I realized oh my god I'm not qualified to do anything a lot of ways yeah I mean so I I saw so another girl who had graduated a year ahead in front of me Phyllis Whitehouse and she waited tables for a year she said hey let's go to the city I'm like okay may as well and off we go to the city and within two weeks I had a, a two, two, whatever, a three, third floor, two floor walk up flat. Oh my God. We slept in trundle beds, you know, where if one comes out, there's no, there's no now floor space in the bedroom at all. Right. So one of us had to be in bed before the other bed came out. Boom. And, uh, <laughs> the, you know, the only sink was in the living room and it wasn't mm. deep enough to wash anything. So we had to wash dishes in the, in the tub, as I recall. Anyway. <laughs> It was precious. And I had a great waitressing job. The first two weeks I was there, I, I got a great uh, job serving people in a uh, seafood restaurant at 81st and 2nd. And why am I telling you all this? Except that I didn't know I was going to be an actress, but mm -hmm. I thought, what the hell? It's the only thing I know how to do, even if I don't do it very well. And uh, wouldn't you know, another SUNY graduate, uh, Nancy Wade, calls me out of the blue in New York. Hey, hey. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this backers audition, which means a performance has been um, created of, of, of an original work. And now they're looking for producers to back it. So they, so they, okay. do, they do a performance essentially mm -hmm. for people that might have money and step up to, to back the production. Um, and she said, one of the girls dropped out. And she said, I just know if you come and sing for Keith, who wrote the music, Keith Levinson, you'll get in. So I went, I did, I sang, I got in, we got the money. We, we put the production went up and, and I'm telling you 
weeks after I got to the city. Who comes to see it but another SUNY grad, uh, Karen Dale, a uh, Swigo grad. And she says, I want to introduce you to my agents. <laughs> I mean, what could be easier? Right. right? Yeah. Nice. And, I, and I meet Juliet and Lester Lewis. They never had kids, but they treated their clients like their children. <laughs> and they both, they both had very gravelly voices because <laughs> she smoked Paul Malls and he smoked a pipe. <laughs> Lester and Juliet. And so he took, they took me on. And within weeks of getting to the city, now, now maybe a handful of months, I had my first national commercial for screen, for, for um, I had to join Screen Actors Guild for Oil of Olay. Wow. It was just ridiculous. Yeah. It's, it was just crazy how easy I backed into this profession. Mm -hmm. I did, I did, uh, Phyllis would go, she would go to the open equity calls, right? Because that's where I came from was stage and musical theater. I didn't, I didn't even begin to know how to relate to the camera, so to speak. <laughs> but Phyllis would go to these open non-equity calls and she would be singer number 223. And God bless her, she'd go back two hours later, wait for her turn and sing her 16 bars. And I admired the hell out of her for that. I didn't have that kind of moxie. I just didn't. <laughs> I, I, I thought if I just hear three people sing in front of me, I'll be destroyed. I'll be all, I'll implode on myself. I just did not have mm -hmm. that, that kind of uh, courage and confidence. So I didn't, I never knocked on a door where I wasn't expected. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and, and again, that's not ego. That's, that's a lack of confidence. Because I think if you, if you do knock on that door and you go through that door and you say, hey, hey, I'm trying to get your attention because I have talent over here, you better deliver. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? For sure. And, yeah. and, 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 I, and I, didn't, I didn't have that kind of confidence. So I just waited. I just waited for people that I knew to, 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 to I, I guess I was in the right spot at the right time. Absolutely. And, 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 it's, and it's not, I, listen, it's not like I don't think I have anything to offer. That's not it at all. Mm -hmm. It's just... It's just, I, I let my friendships and personality kind of shape where my career went and, 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 and coincidence or circumstance, if you will, versus, you know, a, a, a studied application of how I was going to do this and, you know, and, and, and an approach. Life just happened to me and it happened so lovingly and gently and easily uh, that, that, that it's kind of astonishing when I look back, to be honest. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, and I maybe like, during I, those, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just thinking that, you know, I like it when the, when things find you, it makes it yeah. feel better. Like, you know, cause I went all the things I've done from, from teaching to what I'm doing now to maybe, you know, singing at an Elvis show, none of it was <laughs> me saying, I'm going to do this. Like I it was no arrogance. I'm humble. I didn't want it. nothing to do with it. But it just all naturally happened, you know, whether you showed up at karaoke one night, your friend signed you up, and then the crowd went crazy, and they're asking for requests. But yes. it makes, that way you don't have to, you don't feel like you're bragging. Like, you know you can do it, but you'd rather get the accolades. Someone saying, yes, we believe in you, because that, that sure. drives you so much better. And then when you get done, say, oh, that was awesome, but I'm glad someone believed in me, instead yes. of kind of saying, because there are so many people that push themselves out there that don't have. They don't have the chops. They don't have their, their kind of false pretensing the, their ability. Right. And so when things do work out naturally, I feel like it's, that's the path it was supposed to take. You don't have to always push for it. You just, those opportunities arrive at the right moment. Um, and, well, and, and I, I do, you feel that, I think that helps to give you the confidence because now yeah. you're like, Oh, I'm wanted here. I feel yeah. that yeah. sort of love I'm getting from that. Yeah, absolutely. It, it beats itself. Um, yeah. I, you know, I've often made the, the, the observation with friends that, you know, might still be in the business or not, uh, you know, when I visit LA that, that if you have, if you have a connection, that's just that much more further along than you are, uh, and, mm -hmm. and whose success has the ability to pull you up, that's everything. And mm -hmm. if you don't have that, you really are swimming alone. You're just, you're just, you're just like, oh, oh, dear God, you, mm -hmm. you know, you know, and I think the, the more successful people had that, had that advocate, that person who, you know, never doubted their talent or, or saw their talent and knew how to, to get it to the right, 
you know, project. Sure. Yeah. So now you've done this national commercial. That's a yeah. pretty big deal. So where, where do things go from there? Where does it? Well, well, I just, I just kind of kept auditioning and, and work would come. And, and oddly enough, I never gave up my waitressing job because again, you know, humility never assumed it was all going to work out. Yes. Uh, and I worked with the most amazing women and we would all sub for each other. If somebody got a show or a performance or a job or whatever, uh, mm-hmm. And I joke that I still have women covering my shifts now. It was that good <laughs> job and that I might need it again one day. Um, yeah, just little by lots. I, I was working. I and this was, is all in New York still. This is Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, like my first movie role was in a movie called Ghost Story. Mm-hmm. And, and I read for the lead, but the lead ended up going to somebody who later came into my world, Alice mm-hmm. Creek. Yeah, Alice Creek. Lovely. <laughs> lovely human yep. being uh a uh, ghost story was written by peter straub right mm-hmm. up there with um i think he, he was he was maybe a a momentary competition to stephen um king mm-hmm. uh, right about sheer terror peter straub no. anyway uh yeah i you know just these little nuggets would come my way and my my agent felt i was coming very close to the rare instance when I was uh, reading for a pilot I was coming close but it didn't happen often enough and they felt th- th- this is now I'm in New York a little over three years and they felt I should go to California so they so they uh I had an old friend of theirs who was a child actor and now a manager in the business his name was Michael Mann not the director not okay. you don't, don't confuse him with that guy right. um <laughs> Uh, 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 Michael Mann flew to New York and met me and, uh, he said, I I'd like you to come to LA and I'll, and I'll, I'll, you know, work with you. I'll represent you. So I said, I, I didn't want to go, to be honest. I really didn't want to go, but everybody felt there would be more work. And I, and I, and I said to my family and I said to my friends and to the representation, I said, I'll give it six months. If I don't get a job, I'm going back home. Cause I'm a Northeastern girl. I'm not a Southern California girl <laughs> by any means. I like the weather. You know what I mean? I like, I, I agree with you. Yeah. The snow is, I actually enjoy the snow. <laughs> yeah. The change, you know, just, yes. just, so anyway, the long and short of it is I went out and I got a job in the fifth month. I think it was a, a John Ritter oh. movie oh. week. Oh, neat. And, and I went, God damn it. I, I now I have to stay. <laughs> no, seriously, I was like, hey. and I wonder what my life would have been like if right. I had not gotten that job because I would have I would have come back to New York for sure. Mm. Um, you know, I didn't know that my father would be would be uh, dead way too soon. Mm. You, you know, I've always I look back now, guys, and I regret that I didn't live in you know closer to upstate New York while the while the years while my parents were still alive. Um, but you know, no, no regrets. We can't change things. Right. Just Certainly. making a comment that I got that damn job. And then later <laughs> that summer I did, um, I went out in January and that happened in May or early June, right in the nick of time. And then I think I did a night rider. Yes. Oh yes. Summer. And, and I were talking about this not, not long ago. Yeah. Yes. And it just kind of tumbled. And I remember, um, uh, I just remember having really good when I first went out, guys, um, one of the things they did back in the day, I don't know if they do it anymore. My manager set up a lot of general meetings. So I didn't go over in relationship to a, to a part or a project. Mm-hmm. I simply went over to meet the casting head at Paramount or mm-hmm. Warner Brothers or 20th Century or whatever it may have been. And it was in one of those meetings where this woman came out from her desk and said, where were you when we were can- casting Winds of War? <laughs> um, no 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 so, so so now i you know i know somebody had an immediate reaction to what type of role she thought i would play um somebody else said has anybody ever told you you look like renee rousseau and i and i had been saving cosmopolitan covers because yeah. i felt like you know depending on the angle i thought oh my god that could be me that could be a photograph of me <laughs> um uh so so and at that time, I met the Paramount casting people. I met Elsa Bergeron, and she remembered me 
what, whatever it was a good year and a half later uh, to bring me in for Star Trek. So it was one of those general meetings. Do you know what I'm saying? That planted the, the seed for the later meeting in relationship to a specific part in a specific movie. And she was lovely. Elsa Bergeron and Stuart Jensen. I still remember them. You know, who could ever forget their ca the casting people that, you know, <laughs> threw them a beautiful bone with a lot of meat on it. Um, <laughs> uh, well, it's yeah. funny because like, so Star Trek, the motion picture came out, what, that was, I think it was December 79. And it did well. It wasn't a huge, massive hit as, as like Star Wars was. Yeah. Then, yeah. you know, uh, three years later, they released Star Trek II, much bigger hit, uh, and they did it on a smaller budget. So they, they, you know, they definitely saw the returns on that a lot sooner. So naturally, they're like, we need to do part three. And the unique thing was that this was, because um, at the end of two, without spoiling it for the audience out there, if you haven't seen it, and you're listening to our podcast, you're probably in the wrong place. But when Spock <laughs> dies, um, that was a huge thing because he said that was it he was going to die and that was it he was supposed to leave the part that was it but then something you know they're like hey we want to they were talking like can we bring you back and he's like if i can direct i think that's how it sort of went oh and then him coming back to direct was sort of that saying okay i, I you know i i I'll, i'm back you know i'm, I'm going to be spock again type of deal if i'm if i'm correct on that i might be wrong uh on that but i i can't dispute you one way or another i just would seem to me if they consider these these films a a a uh, a trio a, sure a plot the plots were i thought interwoven yes and they knew the second one before they wrote the first I, th then it's surprising to me they didn't you know that leonard was meant to not come back or stop. that was my initial understanding <laughs> yeah. his character died and that was that was the end could, could have, could but, be. Yeah. so and in, in, in two they had obviously um kirstie alley playing the role of Savik. um and then she decides not to return for the third right. film. So they're like, we need to find the right person to take over this role because it's a pretty substantial role in this film. Because they they established the relationship of those characters in that second film. They wanted to sort of, you know, continue it in that in the third. So yeah. now that sort of comes your way at this point, right? You're you're kind of a <clears throat> yes. Being, you know, that's that's always been a a, sub a subject of interest to people. You know, what is it like to come into a, um, you know, an established part and, mm -hmm. and, and played by someone else um, already so successful? And, and I have to say, you know, it might it might have been hard, uh, except that Leonard Nimoy's tack, I think, was so thoughtful and generous to me. Uh, in other words, um, I was never made to feel like I had to kind of, you know, imitate or or echo someone else's mm -hmm. work or interpretation mm -hmm. um it was as if the part were born the day i was cast honestly um that's, and, that's and, and it makes makes once i had some distance between the actual work itself and uh, uh you know the experience i i can see why he did that because he obviously had a different take on the character then, then by that point, guys, I had never seen two, and I've only I'd only seen it in recent times, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you all, the, the those of you who had seen it, were telling me how different the interpretation was, mm -hmm. and it and it just you know informed me how, how much uh, any any character is likely the collaboration of the actor and the director. Right. In this case, very much so mm -hmm. because I I shook. Leonard Nimoy's hand the first day of work and I said Mr. Nimoy you seem to think I know what I'm doing <laughs> don't. and and I said you know I just I just please and he said Robin he said I will guide you every step of the way you will not be out on that limb I will not leave you dangling there and I said okay oh. deal and so before every scene he he he'd wave me over and we would sit on the edge of the set somewhere and he'd say, okay, let me hear it. And we would do the lines. And, and I, I suppose to another actor that might be hugely insulting. To me, it was, it was, you know, manna from heaven. Mm. 
you know, being to, the master Vulcan, I mean, training the younger Vulcan, I'm like, hey, excited. he knows the right. character and he knows how to, he's done it. So he kind of right. knew how to carry yourself as that, you know. There couldn't Vulcan, be anybody, so. anybody better, right, John? I right. mean, that's it. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's I, the master I, that you want to learn from and absorb. Totally. And, like, and I'll say more. that, that if, if those that compare the performances, I always felt that yours was more, and this is not any slight to Kirstie Alley, who's a wonderful actress. But I always felt yours was more Vulcan than hers was. It always felt more of that race. And um, and that's how it was directed. So it makes sense. Right. And you know? it's directed by, like Don said, the master of Vulcan. <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> absolutely. He, he made it the way that it probably should have been. So certainly. Yeah. So no, now for... how did that process go? How did did you were you handpicked by Nimoy or was it was it like a, a, a long process of you going in and auditioning? No, not at all. It was actually very uh very light um uh, um uh, process. Um I met uh as I said Stuart Jensen and Elsa Bergeron one day. <clears throat> the very next day they had me back to meet Leonard Nimoy. I met him one on one, just the two of us in his office. At some point he said, Do you mind if I shoot this or film this? Uh, I said, no, not at all. He, he, you know, he had a video um, mm -hmm. camera running, whatever. Uh, and I think that's what saved me from that pressureful second visit, third audition, whatever, a, a, in which an actor's trying to figure out, do I do it exactly as I did it before? Do I bring <laughs> something new? Oh my God, what did I do the last time? What was it that they liked that that now I should I should bring back into the room? Um, he, he, I mean, he did send me out at some point with, with, uh, sides, the, the sides are, uh, little snippets of scenes that they want to see you do. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything about the film. So he explained to me, you know, what the scenes were. And I go out into the outer office and I studied the lines and, 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 you know, kind of familiarized myself with them as best I could. And then I went back in and he taped that. So I so I never read lines again until the screen test, which was honestly a, a several weeks later. Time went by. I was invited to Harv Bennett's office to say hello to the mm -hmm. gentleman. I think I, I think I was introduced to Gary Nardino at some point, but I don't remember the setting. I was sent over to Western Costume to be measured. And mm -hmm. I think I'm, no, I think we waited until the day of the screen test to work on hair and 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 skin tone and the ears and so on um and there were two other women at the screen test but i but some i don't know remember who communicated this to me but someone said don't worry about it you're it they're <laughs> just here as a favor th th that actress knows so and so and this one knows so and so <laughs> don't you know just, just do your thing don't sweat it I'm like okay whatever you know <laughs> heart pounding uh and then I believe I believe within a day I heard that I was given the part oh. mm. so it was a pretty <clears throat> awesome yeah process yeah it seems like and, a very smooth <laughs> very smooth very smooth and imagine meeting Leonard Nimoy one-on-one -on -one, you know instead oh, of I know normally it's a room full of people and you don't even get to you don't even get introduced necessarily because there's too many people to introduce so you sort of you hope you're aiming your 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 work at the right human being mm -hmm. and you leave and you're not you're never quite sure how it all went down you know yeah, so yeah because you hear about how they're they're so much like cattle calls you know they just kind of yes. ushered through so quickly yes. um, but this sounds like hey we're you know it's it's sort of a almost like you're the you're the one right from the get-go that they're they're well, I, I certainly wasn't in the first meeting with him, but he was, <laughs> I mean, he demonstrated such, such um, d diplomacy and gentlemanliness. Um, uh, he, he actually asked me about, because my, my resume at that point was very thin, you know, that that's an exaggeration. And um, uh, it was way thin and, uh, or an understatement, I mean to say, um, uh, and he asked me about work I did in in dinner theater. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh God, <laughs> he's talking to me about dinner theater credits. Bless this man. Bless this man. Is he was it was it intimidating meeting him the first time? I mean, because you you said you'd watched him as a uh, you know as well, a child. Yeah, 
no, no, no. It was definitely, uh, you know, a, 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 a lump in your throat moment for sure. Mm. But he was so, he was so disarming and mm. so kind. It, it was hard not to, it was just hard not to just relax because mm. he, he just, he made it so easy, you know, to just hang with it for a little while. Yeah. He just uh, seems like a very genuine person. Totally genuine guy. I don't even know the man very well, to be honest, guys. Mm. I don't. To this day, I don't. But whenever I bumped into him, he was he was thoughtful, elegant, classy man. Mm. And and I always admired the the truth. I felt like he lived a truthful, authentic life because mm. I appreciated that he was sober, knowingly sober, and also, you know, um, we, when he was struggling with COPD, you know, mm. he, he was right. very honest about, you know, begging people not to smoke, you know, right. just how, how much the habit devastated him. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I appreciated that a lot. So now, now you're cast, you're in the role, we're, we're moving into production. Um, how did that feel? Like you're just the start of this, this process, you know? Yeah, overwhelming, absolutely overwhelming. I did not feel I did not feel like a natural fit. I I uh, uh, just you know had serious doubts about my ability to play a Vulcan. <laughs> um, I I didn't think I had the rightness. Of, uh, I, I I you know he's told me to practice in front of a mirror, not moving my face. Mm -hmm. And it felt it felt forced and robotic and mm -hmm. strange, uh, and yeah, yeah. and it didn't feel like I. It's almost like my head was not connected to my body or something. <laughs> um, and 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 at that point, you know, I really thought I might get a pink slip the first couple of weeks. <laughs> I'm serious, but uh, I trusted him. You know, I just trusted him. And I did exactly as he told me to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, you know, if anybody can can get the best out of me or or mold me into whatever he, he thinks a Vulcan should be in this moment, it's him. It's the master. So just let him do it. So that's <laughs> what I was. I really was a Gumby. You know, I just let him mold me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Merritt Buttrick was lovely, mm -hmm. generous, mm -hmm. you, you, you know um uh willing willing to you know just what you know an actor who is willing to offer their support and is present for you um right. and i worked the second film and square pegs he had done that series as oh, well yeah yeah no 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 i i, I was aware of his talent and mm -hmm. um and, and admired him greatly um uh, but i'm just telling you you know somebody my own my own age was was mm -hmm. particularly nice on the set i was a bit um what's the word, uh, you know, shy and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and nervous around the, the crew, you know, the actual uh, actors, George and Walter and Michelle and Jimmy and, and, and um, DeForest. It's definitely got to be intimidating and overwhelming. Yeah, it's intimidating. Yeah. I mean, it's going from something like Knight Rider to this huge production, <laughs> not just a movie, but a, you know, a Star Trek, an established franchise movie. That's, that's, oh, a yeah. No, it's big. It's so big. And, 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 you know, I just really just tried to stay in the moment and, and do my work. And I was coping with my dad. Oh, uh, uh, and, he, and, and that situation. So I had a lot to be very serious about. I was very serious. And, uh, you know, because Merritt wanted to be playful. And I'm, and I'm like, I can't. This is way too serious for me. I think I'm going to be fired. <laughs> Stop joking. <laughs> um, well, was that, and I, was, and that I did, was, Rob, was it hard with dealing with with your dad? Was that did that make it easier to kind of try to shut off your emotions to be the Vulcan, or did that make it more difficult because that's on your mind and you kind of wanted to be? emotional did it make it more difficult because i know some people are kind of method or use like a life experience to mm -hmm. to to put into a scene to utilize that or or was it something that was you know i it's a good question and i don't i don't remember the two things uh yeah. interfering with each other yeah 
to be honest. Hmm. I, I, that is a really good question. And I, I would imagine, I would imagine what was going on with my dad lent, you, you know, the gravity to even, even as much as the pond farm moment or, or, oh, or, right. or was, or was, or, or the moment where we're about to be, somebody's going to be killed. Mm -hmm. And David, David died. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, all of that. I'm sure. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm sure there was an undercurrent uh, of, of, of what was going on with my family and, you know, in, within me somewhere for sure. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. It, it, and it, you got to think about, you know, you have to kind of switch it all off to yeah. perform in that Vulcan state of mind, you know, it's, it's. Well, it, it's I'm, I'm reminding myself that, that I, my, my memory of the film was that everything in it dies. Right. Essentially, yeah. I didn't think yeah. it was funny. And it yeah. turns out it's funny. <laughs> right? It's got some good, good, good oh, yeah. funny moments in it. Funny. And I had completely forgotten those. Mm -hmm. I, I, so it, 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 the pandemic brought people out of the woodwork <laughs> to, to find creative ways to connect, you know, especially like this, right? right? Mm -hmm. it, because Fair. now we don't have to be in the same room. We can Zoom. Absolutely. Uh, and be together. And so yeah. a lot of different people reached out to me and I thought, you know, maybe it's time to watch this stuff again. So I watched Star <laughs> Trek 3 and I watched the Next Generation episodes and I'm like, wow, I forgot that. You know, it's it's good every now and then, I suppose. Yeah. I've waited about 30 years, but uh, <laughs> I really did. I thought Star Trek 3 was very serious and, and I was happy to go back and realize that it had some humor in it. Oh, a lot of humor and a lot of, a lot of just excitement, action and adventure. It was, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a well-rounded uh, film. It, yes, it really it was. Yes. Yes, for sure. And I must say that it's it's accented beautifully with James Horner's score. I love that mm -hmm. uh, score that he wrote for that movie. It's yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and Nimoy's direction is beautiful. the The cinematography is is fantastic in that film oh. because I mean everything's on a soundstage, right? All your your exterior yeah. of the planets are all soundstage yeah. sets. Mm -hmm. Um, so he, you have to make that look convincing enough that it's larger scale and this and that, and it it looks wonderful. Oh wow! Yeah, I can see it behind you. Kind yeah, of. Yeah. I do have that. No, that's upstate <laughs> New York. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> the snowiness. <laughs> <laughs> that's not Genesis. <laughs> yeah, one of my one of my favorite moments is when um, Sarek and Kirk mm -hmm. are connecting. Yes, and the, mu the music there, and the lighting, and yeah. Kirk's eye. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's yes. very moving, and the fire in the background. Oh, yes. Oh. It's like it's weird to say, but those sort of moments give you like goosebumps. <laughs> they do. They and do. I think like things like the music helps to elevate it at that moment. It's just yeah. really cool. oh, it sure does. Yeah. Yeah, and, and revisiting that film, and I always remember um, that that one always stood out to me. I always really enjoyed mm -hmm. three just because of mainly because i love when they steal the enterprise and then they blow it up that like you say everybody's dying the planet's blowing everything is just it's just it's sort of like almost like this restart uh for what goes forward from there and it's it's a it's yes. a great story like like death to rebirth uh type mm -hmm. of thing it's yes 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 wonderful well, underpinning, uh in that story i love that movie but it's very well done. So now, you know, you've, like I said, you, you now say you finished production, you go to see this, like the premiere of this film. Um, what was that like? I mean, how did that sort of. Uh... Oh, well, it was, it was thrilling. You know, I, uh, my, um, my brother and his wife flew out from upstate New York and we went to, I forget where it was, where it came out, where the screening was in LA. Uh, was he still a Star Trek fan at this point? Like, was he... Roman's man's Chinese or anything? Um, yeah. no. Oh, yeah, oh no, my brother was a. It's still a huge. Okay. He's still yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He's a truck. So that's got to be yeah. a real thrill. That he's like my sister's Big in this time. movie. <laughs> Big time. I, yeah. I got a. Uh, uh, he sent me a T-shirt. He said, "Uh, it, 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 something like it is logical. You were cast as Savick. It is logical." <laughs> and and then my 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 parents sent a telegram uh may the force be with you 
<laughs> nice, oh, nice, nice sentiment, but wrong. Nice. Nice guys. <clears throat> Close. Yeah. Anyway. No, it was, it was, it was the film coming out was mind blowing. I was all caught up in a, I was all caught up in a, a world romance. Uh, so my manager in LA convinced this man who, who was Egyptian and, and, and uh, Italian to cast me in a lead in, in, this, in this foreign film called Un Filo Bianco, Un Filo Nero, which is a white thread, a black thread. And I played a young uh, Jewish attorney uh, in Manhattan who goes over to Israel. She thinks to get engaged in um, the, the cause of the Jews and ends up defending Palestinians mm. in, uh, in, in the prisons, and et cetera. Uh, and it, so it was a world, um, uh, an exotic world cast, Italian actors, French actors. It was so interesting. We shot at Morocco for oh, three no. months, three or four months, um, uh, early in 1984, while the film, while Star Trek was being edited and put together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I, I had a romance with the, with the, uh, the perruquieri, the hairdresser, <laughs> Luciano de Gregorio, uh, and so I was all caught up in going to Rome after the film shot, but but making sure I got home for the for the premiere. Mm -hmm. Rome, Italy, I meant. Um, to, to come home. <laughs> yeah, that's because you're from Rome, New York. <laughs> right, right. Uh, Very but the, similar. You know, the best thing, the best thing later that year was when it came out in the theaters, and I was in Riverside. Oh yeah. Uh, oh my gosh. Riverside Mall. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And 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 we took oh my god we took we took the the local uh, funeral home uh, I want to say hearse but it wasn't the hearse it was it was the um, limo okay the, yeah the family and they lent it to my mom and dad because they knew my dad was not in great shape mm -hmm. and uh, so my dad and my mom and my grand I had two grandparents at that point. <laughs> and myself we all went off to the Riverside Mall <laughs> in, in the funeral home limo. Uh, and and watch the movie with neighbors, you know, and friends and stuff, and and then uh, friends in New Hartford had a big party afterward. Oh, that's it was awesome! Sweet. It was very sweet. Yeah, yeah, no, it was wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> and and here it is, you know, like we said, thirty eight years later, and you know, we're still we're still talking about it, and we're still talking about how much we we loved it because it's still such a great, oh, great film. and yeah. you know, we're, we're so glad that you were a part of it. Thank you. Me, me too. Me too, guys. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I I have had more than my fair share of, of as I mentioned earlier, wonderful tri trips and Star Trek cruises and conventions, mm -hmm. you know, hither and yon, uh, all over the globe, really. Uh, and, and it looks like now there are so many actors, so many new franchises, you know, um, mm -hmm. And so many actors, current actors in demand that it's, it's, I, I, I have one appearance. Uh, I didn't think I was going to be going out quite this soon, um, you know, out of the picture, I meant. Uh, mm -hmm. but I have one, one uh, uh, invitation. I'm going to be in Orlando, I think in October okay. of 2023, but that's it. Wow, really? And that's, and that's unusual. Mm -hmm. So I may, I may, you know, be saying goodbye to that experience simply because it's such a crowded uh it, it it's a crowded is. room mm -hmm. you know yeah. and yeah. i think i think the 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 convention has kind of gone by the wayside to some i mean they've gotten so big and so that's the thing that big. who who yeah who, who can manage it I, it's not many right so, yeah I, we we because we do one here at, at mohawk valley community college um utica yeah, if you're ever you you're more than welcome to come. <laughs> but uh -huh. we, we have uh we had a a writer he's written for GI Joe for decades. He came up to the show this year. He loved it because he he hates New York Comic Con. He's like it's too big. He's like yeah. he loves the small, intimate show where he can just you know it's it's quieter. Yeah. There's not as many people yeah. crowding him. You know, I mean he's he's you know in his uh, I believe he's in his seventies at this point. He doesn't you know it's 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 too much. So, yeah, yeah. What's the name of your your um event? Uticon, we call it. Uticon. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Okay. Yeah. 
it's 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 all done. We do it for charity. It's for the American Cancer Society. So all our proceeds go to that. But it's a it's a it's a nice intimate small show. But it's it's a lot of fun. One day <laughs> at the college. Yeah, right at the MVCC. We do it. Sweet. Yeah. So every October we do it. <laughs> that was pretty awesome when they brought George in. Oh, what, I know. Four or five years ago now, or was yeah. it longer? Yeah, it was like about four or five years ago, I believe. Yeah, and he was just in Oneana. Uh, Don just went and saw him in Oneana. Yeah. Oh, really? Great. Yeah, cool. it, was, it was wonderful. Yeah, we sat right up front. So it was just really just nice to hear the story. Oh. I mean, I've heard some of the story before listening to Howard Stern or whatever. So I kind of knew a lot about sure. the book and about, you know, and, and about the, you know, the, the musical and everything. But to hear deeper stories and have, yeah, just what a nice, what a mm -hmm. nice guy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just, yeah. Extraordinary. Just the one to envy, but. Yeah. yeah but um now, I, yeah i was just one I, I i keep thinking of this and i and i know that's probably not you know anyone that might be a star trek fan and maybe was younger than me i wasn't the star trek fan from the get-go it was always star wars mm -hmm. kyle and i have yeah. talked about this before <laughs> and it was probably it was probably right around this time i think it was thanksgiving star trek 4 was on tv so that was really my first star trek experience so oh, wow. i didn't go in sequence so i didn't see Kirstie yeah. Alley as Savick. I <laughs> saw you. So then I'm like, well, there's more to the story. I'm like way before the, the whales show up. So I went back and I watched three and then two. And then one. I don't know why. I just oh. I kind of felt like I needed it. So I, I watched it out of sequence. And mm -hmm. I think that's why when I think of Savick, I think of you because you imprinted, you know, the character is the first one I saw. So when I see hers, it's almost like she was the, oh, the kind of replacement, not yeah, it's just, it just depends on where you start. <laughs> but I'm like, that's really where I I started for myself, and and four was what got me into it. And then when I saw three, I'm like, oh, there's now I understand why they're on this Klingon ship, and now I understood. But it was just a weird pull. But four yeah. and three really are what grabbed me and pulled me into the Star Trek world. Mm -hmm. So it was really cool. So I, that's why I've always imprinted on on the Robin Curtis Savick. So thank you. Yeah, there, there's not many for whom I was first. <laughs> so you know, there's one of you out there. It's always interesting to ask what what pulled people in. Yeah, you know which That's it. was it an episode? Was it the original series? Was it the re? You know, for for a lot of people, it was not the original series in in the 1960s. It was just all the reruns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and it was dinner time, and that's what they did. It was a family right. thing, mm -hmm. and I think that's one of the things that touches me most is that. Mm -hmm. Is that Star Trek for for a lot of the fandom represents family and love yeah. togetherness, mm -hmm. and and that's sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Um, but I I don't. Do you have anything else then? Or I mean, probably. Uh, I just wanted to. I it seems to be more of a thing now. Maybe not so much back then, and maybe with the world. Did you ever take anything? Did you take a prop? Did you take a costume oh, piece of bolt, a good bolt from you know bolt from yeah. the Klingon ship something you know well a, a memorabilia they, from the film oh no it's a good question and they monitor us like cray cray yeah seriously like scripts are numbered everything yeah so and everything you know if something's put in your hand at the beginning of the day it's taken out of your hand at the end of the day right. so so the best i got out of uh star trek three were used ears Meaning they had just been removed from my head and they were yeah. going in the trash. Uh -huh. And I did my best to resurrect a couple. And I, I, I think I may have finally sold them a couple of years ago in Vegas. I'm not sure. I can't remember <laughs> exactly. But I yeah. that, and I believe I did when I did um, uh, Talera uh, on the next gen, <laughs> I think I took the little neck the little neck piece that was on my neck. I, I don't remember exactly what that did. Um, but but again, it was removed from my body. It was on my body. It was removed from my body. Yeah. So, so there was an easy, easier chance of of scarfing it, yeah, um, yeah. You know, or whatever the word is, uh, nicking it. You know, from from the situation. Yeah, no, I'm not much of a th thief. I'm a, I'm a good girl type of person. Well, I, I'm a rule follower. So. Yeah. so I couldn't. Yeah, I didn't walk yeah. away with anything juicy. Yeah. Ah, well. Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much for um, oh, joining us. Thank you so chatting much. Chatting about this has been great. Enjoyed it very much. So I, good to see you again. Listen, thank you. Thank you for your patience with me, Kyle. 
Oh, oh not a problem. Appreciate Anytime. It. Okay. <laughs> we like okay. I said, this program we do, we we record very infrequently. So we're we're like whenever you guys are available that, that yeah. can be on here, we, we'll make it happen. <laughs> I want to wish you both this phenomenal Thanksgiving. Oh, and, you as well. Thank and you, yes, thank you for you pulling me out of the ether. I appreciate it so much. And I send you both my affection. Well, our, our thoughts are for Savic the series, so you're not done yet. That's that's it's bound to happen. <laughs> Everyone else is getting something. It's, uh, yeah, right. It, it seems to be happening for everybody. So thank why God. Not? I'm not counting on it, but we'll see. Uh, we are. So it'd be awesome. <laughs> it would be. Thank you. Live long and prosper. Right. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.